Hi there. Um, hopefully you can all hear me if my mic is working. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. I will pace around with my one hand in my pocket probably because that's the way, uh, as a recent reviewer called me, um, precocious children talk in environments with uh, lots of senior people. Um, so moving swiftly on, I'll try and keep to time. Um, I was asked to, to look at how I see the nature of, of kind of air, space, air power changing through the sort of period out to 2040 um, by the chief. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if that, yeah, so where I see the big problem is the absolute prevalence and dependence upon these categories of things. I, I realize telling a, a room and an audience full of many, many fast jet operators that it's the big, slow or uh, remote things that are the problem is a good thing, um, but uh, bear with me. Essentially, all of these things are critical to the edge that Western air power still exerts in every conflict zone that it is deployed to. Without these things, and most importantly of all tankers, we'll get back to that, Western air power at reach simply does not function. And next slide, please. Obviously, other people uh, in countries that we don't need to name, but they're Russia and China in particular, um, have looked at those and gone, right, how far can we push those back? Can we push those back to a point where they can no longer do their job effectively? Because at that point, you don't even need to destroy the enablers if they're far enough back that the organic sensor picture is no longer useful. If you're far enough back that your role as, an, as a C2 node, whether that's with a traditional AWACS fit or with something as, as modern and innovative as a sort of you know, carry-on combat cloud, if that is so far back that line of sight to things that are far forward no longer works, well, that's a problem. Um, equally, if your big wing ISAR uh, assets, particularly the US Air Force's big wing ISAR assets, are not able to get in and do their particularly passive sensitive job, um, then, you know, frankly, a lot of the targeting procedures for the standoff capabilities we have don't work terribly well either. Next slide, please. Um, it's also made a lot worse by the fact that, particularly in the, in the Indo-Pacific, where there are far fewer air bases, Europe has this wonderful um, benefit, or at least potential benefit, as an air operating environment that, if you fly over it, any of you who have will know, there are airfields everywhere. Not often in a very good state of repair, but should we choose to, and I would submit and sometimes try to, if ever given a bit of time with a policymaker, that one of the cheapest, easiest things we could do would be to invest in rapid runway reconditioning capability and at least a few more deployable spares packs. But, you know, in Europe, there's an option. But essentially, precision strike capabilities mean that in the Pacific, any air base that is roughly within range for a tactical fighter sortie, even with one refueling uh, pass off the Chinese mainland, is likely to be created very, very quickly and repeatedly. Um, which means, of course, that not only are your enablers further back um, because of those threats, those long-range surface-to-air missile threats, those uh, long-range air-to-air missile threats often now carried in the Pacific, at least by relatively low observable AESA-equipped aircraft that can come and hunt your enablers. Um, those are also further back, but they're also more essential because your tactical fighters, especially in the Indo-Pacific, are not generally going to be able to operate within comfortable range of the area of operations. Um, it's also worth reminding ourselves why this is not just an air power problem. The reason this is much more of a joint problem is because ground forces and maritime forces stand fast the US to a degree, although even there there is a huge degree of dependency, but ground and maritime forces have been equipped, trained, organized and armed with the presumption of air superiority. We simply don't have the firepower or the resilience to war fight in the other two domains without control of the air. So this problem, which is not really of air forces making, is a joint problem. Next slide, please. The US has various solutions that they're working on. I won't uh, try and second guess General Brown, um, who I'm sure will give you a much, much better view of this than I ever could. Um, but suffice it to say, because of their increasing focus on the Indo-Pacific specifically, they are moving towards a range of technologies, be they piloted or unpiloted, which emphasize range and reach, that ability to operate forward much further from those enablers or those bases that are much further back. But again, that means large, long range, expensive platforms, whether that's NGAD being discussed perhaps in a long range and a short range version, I'd be interested to know what the outer mold line differences are there and how that affects the stealth and the FCS. Um, but it means things like the putative RQ-180, perhaps combat capable in terms of air-to-air, -air, combat capable derivatives to escort a B-21. Uh, it means things like the MQ-25 to try and improve carrier strike group persistence uh, at a long uh, standoff range. 
All of these things have one thing in common, which is that none of them are particularly applicable to any air force that plans to predominantly fight in Europe, because none of them uh, offer a sort of cost-benefit trade-off that makes sense for air forces whose primary concern is lack of combat mass and vulnerability of a few exquisite assets on a limited number of air bases. All of these systems would make that problem worse, not better, for European air forces. But for the US, they make perfect sense. Next slide, please. So for small air forces in particular, this, faces, this creates a big problem in the longer term, particularly out towards 2040, I would argue. Because for small air forces, it has been a, a long been a very smart investment strategy to rely on buying into American programs, which, such as the F-16, which then allow relatively small nations with limited budgets to benefit from all of that massive research and development and combat expertise that the US brings to the fight. The same could be true of, uh, said to be true of, of investments in, for example, British or American, or, sorry, British or French kit. Um, if the Americans specifically are increasingly designing for the high-end fight in the Indo-Pacific, where do those smaller nations go? And I would argue there's two basic routes which you can, you can sort of characterize between the Grip and E and the, the F-35, and we saw with Switzerland what way most countries seem to be jumping at the moment. Uh, remains to be seen if that goes forward. But either you continue to buy into what the US is doing where it is most applicable within what's available, but you accept that mass necessarily continues to shrink, arguably to a point where your force structure is almost self-defeating. Uh, you know, if you look at, for example, certain F-16 nations really struggling to sustain a deployment of four to six F-16s for more than six months with a force structure of between 45 and 60, well, they're now looking at F-35 forces of between 30 and 35 for the most part. So what does that actually translate to in terms of real, deployable, sustainable combat power? I would argue not a huge amount, even if you do collaborative work. So you have to do more and more and more with exquisitely small forces. Or you go down the, we're going to do things the Swedish way, we're going to try and design to our own defence requirements within Europe or elsewhere. Um, but that definitely implies a distinctly different ecosystem, both industrially, operationally, in terms of interoperable um, requirements, etc. Uh, and this is increasingly, I think, going to be true even for the medium-sized powers who are trying to do things through Tempest, through uh, SCAF, FCAS, whatever that happens to be, I would say we're being pushed a bit further down that top route. Uh, and those next generation programs, exciting as they are, are probably a, a symptom of that. Next slide, please. Beyond the hardware, however, I would say the C2 is the most important change that we're going to see. And this, once again, is driven by the Americans. It goes back to this point about the enablers, the fact that your E3 or the next generation of E3 is not going to be a large, wide-bodied asset that can sit roughly 100 clicks behind the main line of contact and perform a mass sensor or um, uh, data link relay or both function. Instead, what the Americans are talking about through JADC2, through the ABMS program, is a you know, UAV and combat platform mounted self-creating, self-generating, self-healing network that gives you Uber-like sensor shooter matchings pretty much at, in real time. It's an incredibly advanced undertaking. Uh, they've got a lot of stuff to build on, particularly through things like the cooperative engagement capabilities through NIFCA with the US Navy. Um, the Americans will get there because those long range exquisite NGAD B21, uh, next generation air dominance, I should say, uh, or B21 or future UCAV programs are being designed from the outset to rely on non-organic lethality and, and survivability. In other words, they are accepting in the design process that these assets are not necessarily viable in the threat environments they're designed for unless they have that cooperative um, you know, combat cloud type network. But what that also means is for nations which rely on those traditional enablers, which rely on a US KOC construct and SATCOM and all of those other good things, and particularly targeting, um, for their own ability to project power, they're going to face a significantly tricky choice. Because either we design and we build and we organize and we train and we exercise to fit into the new American way of doing things, which by the mid-2030s is going to be highly automated, incredibly rapid, and operate across the joint force, including strategic assets that are held at head of state level for us, things like offensive cyber, space-based strategic capabilities. And most of our air forces, I would say, dare say all of them that are the US, are not set up to exercise, let alone deploy at that level. So either we deploy, we, we buy and optimize our platforms to fit into a construct which is A, incredibly expensive, 
from the perspective of the complexity and the, the should we say, certification and security processes involved, or we accept that we are no longer able to seamlessly plug into that American combat web of C2 and enablement functions, which would mean that the Europeans have to start doing it for themselves. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it does imply a heck of a lot of cost, a heck of a lot of complexity, and probably quite a long delivery time scale. So we probably have to start thinking about that bit now, as we've heard from, the, from Kaz and from the minister, there's plenty of good groundwork to start with, but it can't just be a UK option. If the US is moving to a fundamentally different way of conducting air power, which I would personally contend that it is, based on the specific demands and threat nature of the Indo-Pacific, we need to look in Europe at what we need to start doing ourselves and get ready to do ourselves because by 2035 to 2040, I don't think plugging straight into the US as the backbone is going to be viable anymore without big changes. Anyway, that's me. Thank you.